In the history of Western philosophy, one can often find an anti-Eastern sentiment. It had its beginnings in Aristotle's writings. A proponent of geographical determinism, Aristotle believed Asians were not capable of any form of government besides tyranny due to their hot climate, which supposedly resulted in Asians having supposedly servile nature. Even during the Enlightenment, these attitudes persisted. The 18th century writer Montesquieu stated that Asians lacked any sort of desire for liberty. Today, many Westerners pat themselves on the back with a worldview that West is best and that other cultures have little to offer, especially in the quest to expand human freedom. But as I've shown in this podcast before, the West does not have a monopoly over the idea of freedom and limited government. To those who claim West is best, I point them to ancient China, to Mencius' teachings, a philosopher whose works are thousands of years old, but still impressively relevant today. Mencius was born with the name Menke, or Mengzi. I'm probably butchering that. Mencius is the Latinized version of his name, coined by Jesuit missionaries during the 17th century. And for ease's sake, that's what I'll be referring to him as, because it's what I know best. So, Mencius it is. He was born in 372 BC in the state of Zhou, what is today known as Zhaocheng in East China. Mencius was not born into a quiet or peaceful time, quite the opposite. The ruling dynasty known as the Zhou dynasty had begun to crumble, leading to local lords and dukes carving out their own territories, fracturing the dynasty's hold over China. Many rulers fought against one another in an attempt to brutally expand their power by conquering neighboring territories. Caught between the powerful warlords lay the peasants, who suffered under heavy taxation to fund expanding military expenditures, and at times were the victims of invading armies' torment. Today, historians refer to this era as the Warring States period. It lasted roughly from 403 BC to 221 BC. Quite a long time. Nearly 200 years of conflict. Though this was an extremely miserable time, it produced many intellectuals and scholars who traveled the lands counseling rulers on how to escape the conflict and chaos that plagued China. Though Mencius was born a noble son, his father died when he was very young, and he was left impoverished. His mother was left to raise him alone. At first, Mencius and his mother lived near a cemetery. After living there for some time, Mencius' mother noticed that he had begun to imitate the paid mourners who accompanied funeral processions. She decided to move closer to a marketplace instead. Yet again, while here, Mencius took on the merchant's mannerisms, shouting about his wares to passing people. Everywhere she brought the young Mencius, he took on the mannerisms of people he lived among. Taking advantage of this, Mencius' mother cleverly moved next to a school, where instead of pretending to wail for the dead or sell trinkets at a marketplace, Mencius began to imitate the scholars in the surrounding area, and eventually became a scholar himself. Many later writers deem Mencius' mother to be the cause of Mencius' great intellect, and she was held up as a model of motherhood. As always, behind every great man is a great woman, even if that woman is your mother. While studying, Mencius became a follower of the famous Confucius, who had died over a hundred years before Mencius was even born. Mencius was extremely impressed by Confucius' knowledge. He stated that, for as long as humanity has existed, no one has yet equaled the master Confucius. Since Mencius borrows quite heavily from Confucius, it's worth noting a few things about him. Confucius was inspired by the ancient sage kings of the past. He did not see his own thought as particularly original or innovative. Instead, he saw himself as transmitting the teachings of wiser sages. He once stated, I transmit rather than innovate. I trust in and love the ancient ways. Confucius traveled the lands talking to contemporary kings, trying to convince them to rule more like their ancient counterparts. Many of Confucius' contemporaries advocated for the use of military might and strict punishments to help preserve law and order in their territories. Sound familiar? Might and punishment were the pillars on which they based their ideas. But Confucius disagreed. He believed violence could be necessary, but only as a final resort when no other options were available. For Confucius, the people can only genuinely become virtuous when, and I quote, the heavy burden of oppression has been lifted from their shoulders. Rulers should not lead by coercion or force, but by moral example. Because, as Confucius wrote, if you try to guide the common people with coercive regulations and keep them in line with punishments, the common people will become evasive and will have no sense of shame. But, if a ruler acted virtuously and served as an example to his people, his subjects would be moral without any need for laws, punishments, or official orders or edicts. Originally, virtue was a quality reserved for rulers with connotations of power and excellence, kind of like political charisma. But Confucius made virtue an egalitarian term by arguing anyone could become virtuous by acting with the proper respect for others. After studying diligently as a scholar, supported by his dedicated mother, Mencius yet again, inspired by Confucius, began to travel throughout China, 
offering his wisdom to many rulers across the country. The conversations and debates he had with competing scholars and rulers are recorded in the book, now simply known as Mencius. Scholars have argued that this book was not actually written by Mencius, but instead by his disciples. Whether by his hand or another, I don't think it really matters too much. What matters is, the wisdom of Mencius was preserved for later generations to learn from. While Confucius influenced Mencius enormously, he didn't just copy his work or simply rephrase his wisdom. Instead, Mencius expanded the scope of Confucius' writings greatly, especially in the political sphere. While there are many aspects of Mencius' thought classical liberals today might find dated or too traditional, marring his possible liberal credentials, what philosopher in history is out their odd beliefs and faults? Even if not all of Mencius' work is amenable to liberal principles, there are many kernels of wisdom about the ideal state's nature and the importance of material prosperity coupled with freedom. So, taking this into account, let us take a look at Mencius' political thought in four key areas. Virtue, prosperity, war, and the legitimacy of the state. First off, virtue. Similar to Confucius, Mencius believed that the government existed to cultivate a virtuous citizenry. At first, this sounds like a recipe for an overbearing authoritarian regime of paternalism. Ugh. But Mencius did not believe virtue could be forced upon people. People must learn for themselves by reflecting on their actions. We can see Mencius' distaste for forcing virtue in a story he tells about a farmer. One day, a farmer was inspecting his crops. Seeing that his crops weren't yet ready for harvesting, the nervous farmer begins to pull on the sprouts to help them grow faster. When he returned home, he told his family what he had done. His son ran outside and checked the rice plants and saw they had all shriveled up and died. The moral of the story is you cannot force something to grow. Mencius often used agricultural metaphors in discussing human nature, because Mencius believed, unlike some of his more pessimistic contemporaries, that human nature was inherently good, and all people have an equal capacity for moral development. Even when discussing the wise and revered sage kings, Mencius takes care to remind us that they were the same as any other person. They were not demigods, and virtue can be cultivated. It was open to all people who set their mind to the task. But, saying this, people are not solely responsible for cultivating their own virtue. They have to live in the kind of proper environment. Remember Mencius' mother? She brought him to the right place, and he made him the right kind of person. Borrowing from his mother, Mencius believed that if raised in the right environment, there should be no impediments to people becoming moral beings. But, in Mencius' day, China was ravaged by poverty and war, which stunted people's moral growth, as they had to spend their lives in constant anxiety searching for their next meal or evading bandits or foreign armies. For Mencius, a person can only really become virtuous when three conditions are met. Firstly, a person must have the bare minimum met, access to food, water, and shelter. It would be extremely hard to develop one's sense of morality, starving to death in the cold. Secondly, people must be socialized through learning manners and etiquette through a variety of rituals that convey respect for appropriate people, such as one's family. And only after these two conditions are met does Mencius bring into consideration an individual's effort and the ability for self-reflection. As the old adage goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Individual effort matters. But it comes after those other two. So if people do not have access to a certain degree of material prosperity and security, they will most likely fail to become moral beings. But then the question becomes, how do we secure prosperity and security? Is it through the benevolent state which supplies every person with the means to live well? While Mencius believed the state should help those in dire need, generally he believed the best way to produce prosperity was by following the principle of non-interference laid down by Confucius. During his life, he saw many rulers that heavily taxed their subjects to the point of destitution in an attempt to both enrich themselves and maintain their massive armies. Mencius condemns this kind of behaviour and argues that taxes should be kept as low as possible while still providing essential services. In one of his dialogues, a king asks about his tax burden he's put on his subjects. The king has raised huge taxes and decides he's going to gradually ease it off. The logic is, by gradually easing the suffering of the peasants, all will be good. So Mencius tells the king to imagine there's a person who steals one of his neighbor's chickens a day. Would it be okay if he only stole one chicken a week, or a month instead? Then wait a year to pass, then he'll stop stealing entirely. Mencius answers that this is not the way of the gentleman, and argues for stringent moral standards by stating, If one knows something is not righteous, then one should quickly stop. Stealing is wrong. Whether it is a million or a thousand dollars, both mar the character of the thief. So reducing the taxes eases the suffering of peasants, but this isn't the only policy prescription Mencius recommends. 
Through his dialogues on numerous occasions, Mencius discusses how to best promote material prosperity. And surprisingly, Mencius articulates many of the same points Adam Smith would later articulate in the seminal Wealth of Nations, 2,000 years later. Mencius talks about price fixing, the division of labour and free trade. So Mencius argues that the government officials shouldn't really meddle with the market by fixing prices. Mencius explains that by fixing the price of goods, lower quality wearers will fetch the same price as superior products. Mencius used the example of shoes, explaining that if a finely made pair of shoes and a poorly made pair fetch the same price, why would a cobbler ever bother putting effort into shoes beyond the bare minimum? We'd all be wearing flip-flops. While the intention of people who wish to fix prices was well-intentioned, the results lower the quality of goods for all. Therefore, Mencius believed the market ought to be allowed to function without interference. Mencius understood that any prosperous society has a multitude of professions to fulfil people's varied needs and wants. But there were intellectuals dubbed the agriculturalists who believed that there should be no distinction between those who work with their hands and those who work with their mind. Therefore, every single person should take part in agricultural work. But Mencius believed this was a fundamentally flawed view of the world because it did not take into account the benefits of the division of labour. Mencius argues that to train grain for implements is not to inflict hardship on the potter and the blacksmith. The potter and the blacksmith, for their part, also trade their wares for grain. He then continues to explain, if everyone must make everything he uses, the empire will be led along the path of incessant toil. In more simple words, the division of labour allows for specialisation, which in turn produces more goods and less work overall for society at large. Agriculturists will make society poorer by ridding themselves of other professions. Additionally, Mencius believed in the benefits of free trade. When describing good government to a king, he explained that the sage kings kept taxes low, and while goods were expected at the border, there were no tariffs or levies in the goods in order to promote trade. Mencius believed for sure that the state had a role to play in feeding, clothing, and sheltering the destitute. But he also saw a great deal of potential in the power of markets, the division of labour, and the benefits of free trade. Despite coming two millennia before the field of economics had firmly been established in the West, Mencius explained many of the principles that later liberals would expound, like Adam Smith and Frederick Bastiat. For many leaders in China at the time, the seemingly best way to boast their power was to wage wars of conquest against weaker states. Mencius found this not only ineffective, but morally repugnant as a practice. To make a prosperous and lasting state through war was for Mencius like climbing a tree in search of a fish. Complete madness. How can destruction bring prosperity? War costs time, resources, and most egregiously, human lives. Mencius rightly believed that people would flock to states that cultivate peace and prosperity. Few people flock to war-torn countries in search of a better life. In no unclear terms did Mencius express his hatred for war, saying that in wars to gain land, the dead fill the plains. In wars to gain cities, the dead fill the cities. This is known as showing the land the way to devour human flesh. All that war resulted in was the death for the purpose of expanding some king or lord's ego by letting them say they own more land or own more subjects. Mencius was no pacifist. He believed people ought to defend themselves against invaders, but not actively seek out conflict, especially in a conflict for the sake of supposed profit. For those that wage wars for their own profit at the expense of others, Mencius believed that death is too light a punishment. Mencius had no love for imperialism or conquest. At best, conflict preserves what already exists in defensive wars. But at its worst, in offensive wars, it devours, consumes, and destroys. Mencius had seen this so many times throughout his life. An important question that Mencius asked was, how does a state become legitimate? This is an often asked question in philosophy, but the answers are normally pretty terrible. Mencius did not believe that leaders in power gain their legitimacy merely through being in positions of power. Might does not make right. If a leader is to be seen as legitimate, he must attain what Confucius and Mencius called the Mandate of Heaven. Mencius lived under the Zhou Dynasty, as I said before. When the Zhou Dynasty came to power, they justified their rule by arguing that Heaven, a higher power, had given them the right to rule due to their virtue, the Mandate of Heaven. Mencius appropriates this idea and argues that only the truly virtuous should rule, not merely the strong or the cunning. Without virtue, a ruler is little better than a bandit or a thief at large. But this whole idea of the mandate of heaven seems a little wishy-washy, and almost sounds like a bit like a diet version of the Divine Red of Kings. How are we supposed to determine what is and what isn't the mandate of heaven? Some saw natural phenomena as a proof that leaders were fit or unfit to rule. A good harvest might be heaven blessing you, but a drought might be a curse upon you. Who's to decide what is a natural phenomenon and what's the will of heaven? Interestingly, Mencius believed that instead of observing natural phenomena, we must observe the people who live under a leader, 
and use their welfare as a barometer to the measure of the mandate of heaven. The welfare of the people becomes synonymous with the will of heaven. Mencius states that heaven sees as the people see, heaven hears as the people hear. If the people are content, then the will of heaven is appeased. Mencius was no advocate of democracy, not by a long shot, but he did believe that people's satisfaction with the ruler should be the test of legitimacy. Though not formal consent, it is a gesture in a vaguely democratic direction. Quite the achievement in ancient China, where democracy was quite an alien idea. Importantly, the mandate of heaven cannot be passed down. Mencius saw no issue with hereditary succession, but new leaders still had to earn their right to rule by appeasing their subjects through benevolence. A lofty name and a title are not enough to make a just king. So far, this all sounds well and good, right? But what happens when a bad ruler is installed? One who wages pointless wars, oppresses the people, and enriches himself at the expense of others. This happened quite often. So what do you do? Mencius believed that if a leader cannot provide the service they are obligated to provide, they must be removed and replaced. While talking to one king, Mencius asked him, If one of your ministers had been entrusted to transport your wife and children to a distant land, but when they returned, your wife was cold, hungry, and sick because he did not take care of her, what would you do? The king replied, pretty quickly, he would remove the minister from office, effectively firing him for incompetence. Mencius asked another similar question. What if your chief warden couldn't keep order among the nobles? Yet again, the king replies, basically fire the bozo. He isn't doing his job. Mencius then asks, if a territory is not ruled properly by a leader, how should one handle this? Then the king quickly changes topic, the implication being that, like the rest, he should be effectively fired for negligence. After taking a little longer to chat to Mencius, the same king asks if it is acceptable for subjects to assassinate their ruler. Mencius replied that, one who mutilates righteousness should be called a crippler. A crippler and a mutilator is called a mere fellow. Mencius explains that a ruler forfeits their title when they fail to meet their obligations. They lose their status as a ruler and become a private person, accountable to the same laws as the average person. It is worth noting that in his second treatise on government, John Locke has a very similar justification for resistance to tyrants. Locke writes that, when a person in power quits this representation, this public will, and acts by his own private will, he degrades himself and is but a single private person, without power, without will, that has any right to obedience. Mencius and Locke are quite close on this, I think. But Locke and Mencius believe that when a public official uses their position to further their own aims, they forfeit their right to a position of power. Mencius takes on the Confucian idea of rectifying names and applies it to political legitimacy. An excellent example of this is when Mencius asked a king, is there any difference between a killing a person with a club and killing him with a blade? After the king replied no, Mencius asked, well, is there any difference between using a blade on the government? Therefore, any crime a leader commits is not excused by political status or power. Theft is theft, murder is murder, regardless of the method or personal status. Mencius held those in power to strict standards, even stricter standards than the average person. Like Confucius, Mencius believed leaders ought to be highest ethical character because they are meant to act as examples to the rest of the people. If leaders did not practice ethical conduct, they could be irreversibly corrupt an entire society. But despite years of traveling around China and talking to all sorts of leaders, despite his best efforts, Mencius' career did not produce humane government. Few if any leaders implemented his advice. And eventually, Mencius retired from his travels and began to take on disciples and impart his belief to others. It is possible he became quite depressed at his inability to effect change. The last passage of his work attests this idea. From Confucius to the present time is little more than a hundred years. It is not so long from the era of the sage. We are close to the home of the sage. Yet where is he? Where is he? It's really sad, actually. But when Mencius died, his philosophy did not follow suit. His thought became one of the most cited texts in the tradition of Chinese philosophy. While Confucianism's fate waxed and waned throughout Chinese history, with a series of revivalist movements, it was always kept quite relevant. By the 14th century, four classic Confucian books became the orthodox reading list for any intellectual repute. Mencius's writings were considered among them, and took a prominent place in this four. A group known as the Neo-Confucians eventually promoted Mencius from being a follower of Confucius to actually being a second sage. Pretty high praise. But the words of Mencius were not solely relegated to China, his influence extended beyond into Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. So I'm assuming most people listening to this hadn't heard of Mencius before, and why is that the case? If you did know him before, good for you, you're great, keep it up. The rest of you, 
you're also great too. But why do people not really talk about Mencius? Well, firstly, as always in philosophy, there's a Western bias. Few philosophy curricula include authors outside of the Western world, which is really a tragedy when people like Mencius exist. Another more overtly political reason Mencius has been obscured is due to communism. By the turn of the 20th century, Chinese intellectuals called for the rapid modernization of China and a shrugging off of China's feudal past. Mencius was deemed to be part of this feudal past and his reputation suffered for it. This trend of erasing China's past was energetically pursued by Mao Zedong in the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution. He believed Confucianism to be an outdated ideology of the past when compared to then contemporary communism. Though Mencius was not wiped from the face of the earth, a movement of new Confucianism sprang up in Taiwan and Hong Kong, and the study of Mencius continued. Since the death of Mao, Confucianism has begun to make a comeback, and along with it, the writings of Mencius have seen a similar revival, while Maoism is in the trash where it belongs. Mencius has a fair few beliefs about subservience to tradition and family that might make a few libertarians flinch, but within his writings there's so much to appreciate, especially for libertarians. Mencius believed that coercion was not a viable way to make a morally upright population. Moral example and material prosperity bring about the moral development of the public at large, not rulers implementing draconian punishments and edicts. Coming two millennia before Adam Smith and the establishment of economics as a field of study, he already explained the follies of the state interfering with the market and fixing prices, the benefits of the division of labor, and the importance of free trade. My personal favorite aspect of Mencius's writing is his discussion of removing rulers and applying to them the same rules as any other profession or trade. Mencius effectively said, a ruler is like any other job. Don't perform, you get fired. No exceptions. In a way, he kind of desacralized the profession of ruling and made it accountable to common sense. Today, John Locke is famous for articulating the writer revolution. Mencius talked about this same concept years before Locke's ancestors were even born. In short, Mencius is definitely worth your time. His writings are extremely pleasant to read and they broaden your horizons beyond the accepted philosophical canon of the West. There is much contemporary libertarians can take from Mencius and Confucianism as a whole. And if you want to read more about this, I highly recommend you take a look at Roderick Long's work on libertarianism and Confucianism. So, thank you very much. Thanks Mill for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you may listen to podcasts. Visit the website www.libertarianism.org to find more podcasts like this one. I hope to see you next time.